Hi, my name is Dr. Alan Barnard. I'm CEO of Goldet Research Labs. This video is a short demonstration of one of our latest simulation models, the P and Q game. This example was introduced by Dr. Ellie Goldratt, author of The Goal and Father of Fear of Constraints, in his book, Haystack Syndrome. And it is a very interesting example of how a seemingly simple decision around how much profit can a little business make can become very complicated very quickly and how easy it is to make mistakes. When you look at the screen, essentially you will see all the information that is relevant to answering the question of how much profit this factory can achieve. In the top left-hand corner, you have the demand. There's only two products that this factory produces, the red product P and the blue product Q. The red sells for $90, the Q sells for $100 per unit. There's a demand of 100 units for P every week and a demand for only 50 units of Q. There's operating expenses of $6,000 per week. And you have to decide how much profit are you going to commit to making. It provides you with information around the cycle time of the various machines. So you have four machines, A, B, C, and D. You have only one of each machine. And this is essentially showing the routing. To make one of P, it has to process raw material one on machine A. That then gets transferred to machine C, takes 10 minutes on machine C. Uh, then you need another part before you can assemble them. That requires raw material two to be processed on machine B for 15 minutes. C then goes to C five minutes. Once it, you have both parts together with the purchase part, you can assemble them using machine D and then you have your finished product. Typically what would happen is people will do some calculations. So you can see all the demand for uh, P and Q is 150. And you can multiply that out and see, ah, it looks like I can make a net profit of $1,500. That would be one answer, but it would be the wrong answer. Why? Because we essentially should never make commitments without considering the capacity. One of the key principles on which fear, theory of constraints is based. Well, when I look at my capacity profile, I notice that if I multiply the minutes by the number of units that has to be produced, it looks like P will require 1,500 minutes because all the cycle times are 15 minutes long. Uh, whereas on Q, it's a little bit different because the cycle times are different. But I can immediately see there that my resource B is the bottleneck. It's loaded to 3,000 minutes when in fact I only have 2,400 minutes available on each machine. And that's essentially working 60 minutes per hour, eight hours per day, five days per week. If I had to consider that, I would have to decide, well, which products am I going to produce, P or Q? Which one do I give preference? If I look at Q here, it has the highest selling price. It has the highest throughput or gross margin. It has the lowest total effort or minutes to produce it. So it might seem reasonable to try and do all the Qs and with the remaining capacity do the P. So let's see what will happen if I do that. If I give priority to P, so machines are getting activated trying to produce all of the P and then it will switch over to the Q. I can look at different views here. I can look at my actual actuals that's happening. I can also look at my GAN chart and see how that's going. So I'm currently all machines are working on, on Q. I'm allowing machine C to switch between P and Q to fill up the time there, else I'm gonna be losing a lot of time. Let's run that to the end and see what happened. I ended up producing all 50Q, but only 58 of P. Now, when you do static calculations, you could convince yourself that you could do 60 of, of P, but you really can't because of that initial lost time there on resources C and D because of the interdependency. Uh, but you can see here, essentially what happens if we looked at that v view of the actual, we would have lost $390 trying to produce as many Q as we can with the remaining capacity to do P. So, Let's see what happens if we decide to switch the priority. So rather than prioritize Q, we prioritize P. Let's see. Remember, it's the lowest price. It is the lowest gross margin. It is the highest total labor time. Uh, B is still a problem. So we're going to have to try and produce all 100 of P and with the remaining capacity to do Q. The static calculation shows that we should be able to do 30 of Q, but let's see how much we can practically produce. So again, we can see our machines are now focused on trying to produce as many P as we can. Uh, let's go to the GAN chart and see what's happening there. 
it looks like we've lost a bit of time initially for C and D for those products to reach C and D, uh, but so far so good. And then we run it to the end. Let's see what would have happened. We only managed to produce 29 of Q, not 30, because of that slight delay. So uh, uh, machine C and D doesn't quite have 2,400 minutes available because of that slight, slight delay in the beginning. But this is very interesting. So if I go to my table view, I'm now making $240, which is a lot better than minus $390. And you might ask, well, why is that? How is it possible that following the common wisdom, producing those products with the highest price or highest margin or, or shortest total time gives me a loss, whereas doing the opposite gives me a profit? Well, the secret is, is understanding that you profit maximize a business, not when you profit when you produce the products with the highest margin or throughput, but when you produce the product with the highest margin or throughput per constraint resource. So let's look at that. P gives me a $45 throughput or gross margin. It requires 15 minutes on the bottleneck. So it's actually $3 per minute that I'm getting every time I produce P. I have a higher gross margin of throughput on Q, which is $60, but it takes me 30 minutes on the bottleneck. So that's only two minutes per $2 per minute makes it very easy. Of course, I want $3 a minute and not $2 a minute. But the simulation also allows us to explore some interesting things. Like, for example, I am allowing switching between P and Q on machine C to try and maximize the time. So you can see there 10 minutes and five minutes. If I didn't allow the switching, I forced C to stay on this middle path, I'm going to lose a lot of time. Let's see what happens. Even when I'm giving P priority, if I don't allow the switching, what is going to happen? So let's simulate that quickly. And it's best to look at my Gantt view. I can see there, I still managed to finish a lot, but now I'm losing all that time there. And you can see I'm literally, I run out of time at the end of the week. I, I don't finish any queues. So let's look at my financials there. That's pretty shocking. I was only able to do 58 of P. So now I'm losing $3,390 because I didn't allow switching. Kind of the opposite of what we're doing in project management where we don't want people to multitask and to switch. In a factory, if you don't allow that to happen, at least in this case, you can lose a lot of money. Um, some other scenarios that's very interesting to run is, for example, what if you make your process batch equal to the transfer batch? So when you're producing all 100 here, C can only start once all 100 has been produced. At the moment, as soon as one is finished, so you have a transfer batch of one, it can immediately start. These are all batching policies that can be set. Most people don't realize how consequential it is if they run large batches, not specifically how big the batch is, but how big the transfer batch is. I want single piece flow to get the flow established, but let's just run it for fun and see what will happen. So better to, to look at that Gantt chart again. So let's speed it up. And again, there I can see I'm not going to finish any of the queues. I simply run out of time because C could only start once all 100 has been produced on both A and B before it could start. Whereas if I had a transfer batch of one, C could already start as soon as one of those came out. And again, if I look at my table there, uh, this time I only produced 10 of Ps. I couldn't even get through the Ps now and, and then losing a lot of money. So some very, very interesting analytics that you can do with the simulation. One that I uh, created um, is to show that you really should be very, very careful around how you profit maximize. So if we prioritize P and for some reason, this D operation doesn't take 15 minutes, but maybe 25 minutes. And we look at the financials there, we can see now both B and D is, is, is overloaded. B is still the most loaded, so that should be the bottleneck. So I should focus on trying to do as much P as possible and then switch to Q. But let's see what happens if I do that. Let's speed it up a little bit and we'll get to the end. You can see I could only do 94 of P, couldn't do any of Q. And I've gone from essentially making $240 to losing $1,770. Well, that's really, really bad. Well, what would have happened if I'd gone back to my previous one where I said, well, I'm going to make that 25, right? But um, I'm going to prioritize Q this time. Could I do better? Let's see. So very interesting, actually getting a slightly better result, finishing all Qs and then some of Bs. Still a lot worse. And uh, well, when you play around with it, you'll find that not only there is a mix, a, an optimum mix that gives you the ability to not lose money, make a little bit of money. It's very counterintuitive and it doesn't 
look at what your throughput per constraint resource of either B or D is. It's actually a mix that maximizes the utilization of both B and D. And you can see here, B is utilized at 84% of the time, D is 46%. You see, you can find a mix that gets both of these close to 100%. That's the way to get the most profitable mix. So I hope that uh, I've piqued your interest and that you would be very curious to download our our P and Q simulator and start playing, learning with your team and seeing how you can apply these insights also to your own business.